Praise the Lord, church. Amen. For the straight faces who do not know me, my name is Morodi Titus. I serve in this church. Don't be tempted to imagine I'm a visiting preacher. But I'm largely in Swahili service. In Swahili service, like many will attest, we are used to doing a blended service. We borrow a leaf from the English word, from the, rather from the English language, from Swahili, and if need be, to reinforce our points, our Hebrew tongues, Buana Pewe Sifa. I'm not taking it for granted that I'm standing before you. It takes the heart of the Lord to do it. I'm thankful to God and to them. Today, being the Palm Sunday, is a tough day. It's a tough week. The other day in the calendar of this church, the Mothering Sunday, it was a combined service. Now a mama ariba wimbo nyororo sana that used to add Hosanna, Hosanna, Amen. It starts by saying, Niko na kasiri kangu na huyu Yesu. Na hiyo siri na nifanya niweja siri. Yes, I have a secret with Christ. And this secret gives me a lot of courage. Na nitia uja siri sana. Huku nikiba hosana. Buwana pewe sifa. This day called Palm Sunday. It is otherwise called Hosanna Sunday. It is the day when Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey. It is that very day the Jews waved the palm leaves, spread them on the roads as Jesus rode on them. It is that very day that the Jews even removed their clothing and still spread them on the ground as Jesus rode on them were a donkey. This is the very day for the first time the crowd acknowledged that Christ is indeed the King of the Jews. You could hear them singing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This day would not have been without a background. It's a day of redemption. What is redemption? To, to dim is to own, to possess. To redeem is to reown that which you had and lost and you have reclaimed it back. So today is redemption, redemption Sunday. There is God's original plan for mankind. If there are good things that God ever did during his creation and to the life of a man was to create a man it's like he was creating himself physically, not in spirit. And so the man came into this world. God has an idea in Genesis 1.6. What is the idea? Then God said, let us make man in our image and likeness, that he may rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and the livestock and the wild animals. That was his idea. Very brilliant one. Then he has a plan that in his mind he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Then in Genesis 2-7, there is the execution where man comes into being. You can physically see him there. Then the Lord, God formed man from the dust 
And he breathed into the man the breath of life. And he became a living being. Then in Genesis 2.15, God places the man in the Garden of Eden. And he gives him a very divine assignment to work in that land and to maintain it. And tells him, you may eat everything that grows in this Garden of Eden. But the fruit tree in the center of the garden, kindly do not. And here terms and conditions apply. He tells Adam, if you surely eat or touch this tree, you will certainly die. And thereafter, God realizes that I've actually created all animals in pairs, but man is all alone. And since there is nothing suitable close to him, another idea comes in Genesis 2.18 that it is not good for this man to be alone. I'm happy I have too many near me. I'm pointing at this one closest to me. It is not good that you remain alone. He literally said so. And so in Genesis 2.22, God made somebody else called a woman. That Adam is no longer idle. Adam is no longer alone. Akona mtu wa umbo lake. Sura yake. Kipenzi ya jabu. Buwana apewe sifa. And for God to create Eve Adam akapewa dose akalala. And so from one of his sides akashomwa mbavu moja, one of the ribs came out and a lady was made. Notice that in Genesis 2, 7, God forms a man. Genesis 2, 22, God made a woman. Buwana pewe sifa. From the, from the position I start, I can assure you that these sides, kuna wingi wa hao watu, and they look, wow. They were actually made. Huh? That's how they were. And so, the life goes on in the Garden of Eden. Excellent stuff. There's joy, there's everything they need. But then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 3, while Adam was out there in, at work, like normally happens to us men, a sudden visitor comes. This visitor, where I come from, we say, visitors have their story. Give them time, listen to them. And so this visitor turned out to be the snake and approaches the lady. Kindly note, the lady was not in the pact with God on the do's and do nots. If anything, she may have only learned this from Adam. But the serpent here wants to do us call. Did God really say that you may not eat anything? The snake is very clever. He's, the snake is not being very specific to that fruit tree right in the middle of the garden. Did God say that you may not eat anything from any tree in this garden? The lady said yes. That tree in the middle of the garden is not, a, it is not just a no eat. It's even a no go zone. Don't eat, don't touch. 
probably if the conversation was to go further deeper, the, lady would have, the snake would have asked the lady, where would you go to the snake? Just to do an easy score there. But the snake replies very craftily, Hapa, you may eat. Because the moment you eat this fruit, the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, you will be truly like God. And your eyes will be open. Utajua mema na mambaya yote. This is becoming very strange here now. The lady looks at the fruit and says, it looks very attractive and palatable. She tastes the fruit. Wow, tastes good. Anashuma ingine, anangojea Adam. So Adam comes and he's told, now that the fruit is not in the tree, it's now in the house, you may eat this. I'm wondering whether any man has any menu in his house or goes by prescription. And so Adam, without further ado, went and enjoyed the fruit. What suddenly do they realize? Eh, we are naked. Tukaushi. And while they were thinking of how to cover their nakedness, an idea comes. Within the garden, there are plants that have broad leaves, like bananas, the palm trees. So they decided to do some clothing in, with them. So they started sewing leaves to cover themselves, which they did. And in the cool of the day, I'm imagining cool of the days in the afternoon, God comes visiting them. The Bible says they had God coming. And they did only one thing they hid from him. Then God comes around and looks, ah, has he on him too? Then he calls Adam, where are you? Then Adam did price. I had you coming and I took cover. Kwani, Lila Tudam Meila. Adam now has no defense. And Asema, the woman you brought. Alintedea, alintedea, akaniandalia na nikala. That is no defense. So he was guilty as charged. So God decides because these people have gone against my instructions, I'll get them out of this garden and I will place an angel, the cherubim, with a flaming sword in our katakuili, kieda na ikirudi, so nobody can remain in the garden. It's a bad moment when God's, God's divine plan for man has been interfered with. Satan imagines that he can scheme against the Lord. Man loses his divine possession from God. God had promised to kill him. But he can't. Satan is urging him. Because you said, should they eat this fruit, you're going to kill them. Now make good your threat. God tells him, or God says, Psalms 145, verse 8. We are told, 
God is slow to anger and abounding in love. Mungu si mwepesi wa hasira. Lakini mwingi wa rehema. The Satan do this. He's a compassionate God. And so God from then henceforth decides I have man on my side. My full image and likeness. And something has happened between me and him. And so I've cast him out of the garden. I must do something to get him back to me. Hence, the story of redemption begins. What does God do? The first step he does to, to kill an animal in the garden. And what does he get from the animal? It's not meat. It's the skin from which he covers the nudity of both man and woman. When you slaughter an animal, what do you get? What must come out of the animal? Stanley Omodi tells me it's blood. You are right. That becomes the first blood covenant where God takes the first bold step to recover man. One as if he will. If you may do some reference to Isaiah 53, there's a prophecy of the steps of the mechanisms through which God is going to recover man back to the Garden of Eden or back to himself. Hence the, redemp the redemption agenda. This is through one person God describes as the suffering servant. This suffering servant is described thus in Isaiah 53. One to be despised and rejected by mankind. God gives a description of who this suffering servant, who will be the medium through which God will redeem man back to himself. One held in very low esteem. One with no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing unique will attract anybody to him. Nothing in his, in his appearance that men should desire him. He'll be not loaded with great things that looks very attractive. Like a lady may, you know, may be done on colorful colors to attract. No. And I'm not saying that colorful colors only do one agenda. It's part of clothing is godly. One assigned to the grave with the weekend. That person or that medium through which I redeem man will be one assigned to the grave and will go down with criminals. So he will be consigned down to the grave as a criminal. He will be a spotless one, non-violent, with no deceit in his mouth. He will be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. I can imagine church, we are beginning to understand this description is kindly pointing at who? Who's, by whose woods we are healed? And finally, one familiar with pain. No wonder, man of sorrows. Man of sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came, ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What I see. He has only one mission. This man of sorrows. To reclaim man. Spotless as he is. Dirty as man can be, 
his mission is to redeem him back to God. This man is also coming in a very hidden manner. His identity is not very exposed, even to those whom they spend daily lives with. This is the man. In Matthew 20, 21, we have a mother there called Mrs. Zebedee, whose two sons are always with Christ. And from the sons, she comes to, she happens to, to, to hear that Jesus is coming to establish his kingdom. What does the mother begin to think now? If he comes to if he brings his kingdom, then it is only fair that my two sons, with whom he's familiar with, with whom they spend their lives with, one should sit on the right and one should sit on the left. Meaning, the sons did not know who Christ was. This man of sorrows is very unknown. And so the mother approaches Christ and asks him, Tisha, when you get to your kingdom, ukiuta serikali yako, jeni vya manataka kuwasilisha hoja. Moja keti padi ya kulia, mwingine kuchioto. Ili, mema kutoka serikalini yako, inaguka kwangu mara moja. A very selfish mother. But they all scheme that way. They are very loving to their children. They actually die for their children. <laughs> Jesus asked her, Madam, do you actually understand what you are asking for? That question tells me as evidence that she doesn't know who Christ is. And the story she's getting from the children, her two sons, is also not identifying with who Christ is. Jesus replies that whoever wants to be great must first serve. Now she's, she's thrown back into confusion. What is this service now? Whoever wants to be great must be a servant of them. There's another occasion in Caesarea Philippi. In the book of Matthew 16, verse 13. Jesus is talking to his disciples. By the way, who do people say the son of man is? They begin to mumble things. Yes. They say you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah. Others say you are Jeremiah. While others still imagine you are the prophet. Then he asked a direct question. But who you, who do you say the son of man is? Nothing happens without God's order. Because had any other disciple responded, we could have had stories like the ones that were foregoing. But Peter, Simon Peteru Mwanawayona, Kajibu, you are the Messiah, Son of the Living God. What does Christ say? Peter, this has not been revealed to you by blood and flesh, unless it has come from our Father in heaven. And then go, Jesus goes further and tells Peter, You are the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And not even the powers of heads or hell shall break it down. It will withstand all those pressure. The rest of the disciples cannot have this kind of revelations. There are some points to note here. Even the disciples could not say who Jesus was. 
unless it was revealed to them by our Father in heaven. Many thought Jesus was a secular or a worldly king coming to establish a kingdom here on earth, a political kingdom. Today, I want to confess, many of us don't know Christ. Just like happened in those days. It is true, the LGBTQ agenda is still flying around. <laughs> I can see some people smiling. It is true. Abortion has become a daily occurrence. Social ills and corruption is part of our daily menu. And then there have been a lot of efforts to deodorize those ugly actions. They have been deodorized. They are not smelling as bad. Theft is referred to today as getting rich quick. Tajiri wa haraka. Ukisikia mtu ametajirika kwa haraka, ame shomoka na zamu higine. <laughs> it is being whitewashed, isn't it? Eh? And those people have names. Christian names. Titus being one of them. Eh? Nayakopia. Prostitution. Mekua ni kazi ya kila siku. It's a profession. They are even claiming for rights. It's being called high life. Deodorized as might I a Jew. Corruption in a to opportunity. Kuangukia. These names are there, eh? At Aliagukia. Eh? Aliagukia. Evil schemes in a uh, the plan. Kamchoro. The significance of this day called the Palm Sunday or the Hosanna Sunday. When we read in the book of Matthew 21, and for that matter, verse 5, we are told what is happening is as was foretold by a prophet. Who was this prophet? It is Prophet Zechariah. In the book of Zechariah 9, verse 9. What does Zechariah, what did Prophet Zechariah prophesy about this day? Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king coming to you, righteous and victorious. Glory riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is what is happening today. Then why is there great celebration? Jumapilia Mita Desidiohi. Great celebrations. Why did they celebrate, celebrate in those days? Kindly know the Jews were under the Roman Empire. Those very days. And the Roman, the Roman Empire was a very uh, oppressive regime. Serikali Rikuya Kimabavu. And they ruled the Jews, they ruled the Greeks, and the Romans as well. And so everybody there thought, if you are being ruled by the Romans who are from Rome, it is only fair that us Jews can also have our own king. So the crowd here mistakes Jesus to be another king. This is the idea. So Jews are thirsty of having their own king. And so when they hear that the king of the Jews is, the Jews is riding a donkey, getting into Jerusalem, they are actually launching his kingdom.
kindly note at this time, because of the tyrannical Roman regime, most Jews have suffered. They are being hunted like wild animals. They are harassed right front and center. They have no peace. And so some of them have fled. They have scattered themselves out there. So they have taken off. Waiting to hear what? That they, there is a, a Jewish kingdom that has been put into place so that they can come home. To them, freedom was actually coming home. Ungeskia wakisema, a devil you know is better than a nature you do? You don't. Wasawahili wakasema, zimu ilikujualo, halikuli likakumaliza wewe, linakubakisha. Crowds are filled with hope, anticipations and expectations. I'm imagining a scenario here in Jerusalem that day. I am imagining in my mind. All radio and TV stations, Zinaka Ivi, Jerusalem, because of the king of the Jews, Jews. International and local media are streaming live. Interviews, results as the trickle in, the Kenyan scenario. I know you understand it. Right? Hotels are fully booked. Watch Ayrikuya Nazareth. This time, hotels are fully, both local and foreign visitors. Isn't it? No Uber is available. Transport businesses are stretched beyond capacity. That is what I imagine Jerusalem was those days because these people didn't know and yearn to have this king. But much as there is this joy, something else again is happening. There are schemes to counter this. Yes, there's a scheme to counter this. Who is that the king of the Jews? Nani huyu anaimbiwa? Anaitwa Yesu. Eh. Anakula sana huyu, situmwai. They plot to kill him. People who first plot on Jesus are the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are a religious team, isn't it? They are a strict religious order of Jews. Very hypocritical and critical of Christ. They are accusing Jesus of even healing on the Sabbath. Like one day when Jesus opened the eyes of a, of a blind man on a Sabbath. They accused him of working on the Sabbath. And they asked with intent to nail him down. Is it good to heal on the Sabbath? Then Jesus, knowing their dirty hearts or their dirty might said, if your chip fell into the pit on a Sunday or on a Sabbath, would you not pick it? They said, yes, I would. Then he asked, what is more valuable here, the sheep or the man? And the conclusion was, it is good to do good things on the Sabbath. The Sanhedrin, as we may find in the book of Matthew 26, verse 59. They are the chief priests, the chief priests and the Sanhedrins were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could only put him to death. The Sanhedrins are learned people. Very learned. I wonder whether we could find one in our congregation. They are scared that Jesus' popularity is rising. Everybody is talking about this Jesus, who is establishing the kingdom of the Jews. Nobody is reasoning to them. Their popularity is plummeting. There's a serious bone of contention here. And they have a thirst for revenge. And so 
the whole scheme and plot on Christ's life. We have another class of people called the Sadducees, top class in society. They are aristocrats, supreme organ. We are the upper class, very self, self preserving. Only believed in the five, five books of the Bible Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, called the Torah. That's all they believed in. Every other thing that Christ has come with, they don't believe in it. They also didn't believe in it as in resurrection, because Christ is now preaching about resurrection. Matthew 22, 29 describes them as erroneous people who did not know scripture or the power of God. A very critical thought and hypocritical. Then we have the last man called Pilate. He's the governor of Judean province, which is part of the Roman territory. He presided over his... Jesus trials and all this. But because he's the, an, an earthly governor, he's a political person, can only understand Jesus from a political angle, doesn't really know the divine mandate Christ has in this world. So he listened to the accusers. Uh -huh. King of the Jews. I'd also like to see him. So he's brought to the... And he asks him, you are the king of the Jews? He said, so you say. Anamuangalia hivi, anangalia ufalume huyu kwa huyu jamaa, anahona. You know this is a man of sorrows. Mutu wa shida shida, nothing is very attractive to anybody. And he says, this one is no threat to my government. Si tisho hata kidogo. Now you know Mwashiria. What does the crowd say? sana. We won't. Because it was his tradition that during the Passover he must release, he must free one criminal. So the crowd is now demanding that they need Barabbas to be free. Knowing that he had only been left with an option to nail down Christ, he says, for me, but mess myself with this man. He's not as a criminal as is being reflected of him to me. While all this is happening, Mrs. Pilato is having it very hard in the house. Mrs. Pilate is having it very hard. My nose is running. <laughs> May we resume. Mrs. Pilato is having it very rough in the house. And so she goes to her husband and tells him, have nothing to do with this innocent man. The whole night, I've, got, I've been agonizing. The spirit must have worked on her. And she said, my husband, I love you. Uyo mtu, <laughs> In Swahiri, we have people called Hasidi. Hasidi was Swahili Husema, Hasidi Mbaya. Hasidi Hana Sababu. Hasidis kwa maisha ya tuniwengi. We have them in our lives. People who just may quarrel you for no reason. They probably quarrel you because your son did well in the exams. Things nobody can undo. They are quarreling you because they have anger with you because you have gotten an appointment. And you've been without a job for the last two years. And suddenly a job has, a job has come your way. Other than being joyful to what God has done, Hasidis will just feel very ugly. They may even be very ugly that your crop has yielded well. Kukuzako zimetaka mayai sana. Hana sababu ya hasira yake. Hasidi 
mpe kiti akae this is what that lot did or skimmed on christ can you notice this holy week is actually a week of troubles and tribulations to christ yes he has entered jerusalem with all that glory but that team of schemers are very thirsty of revenge wanasema huyu mtu anakula sana he is becoming very popular and this is the week we work on him and by a strange coincidence tomorrow being monday the church is being converted into a market center jesus goes there and tells them that this house shall be called the house of prayer it is the house of our father anachomboa kiboko na kuadalia kalamu iliyokuwa sawa sawa on tuesday he goes through the fig tree and finds that he meet him and we say ina matai mazuri sana it's thriving very well but he was a, a bit hungry and says can i look for something to eat there and he just goes and sees a very vibrant tree with no fruits jesus cast the tree that may you never bring forth anything in life he did this in the presence of the disciples so what happens the following day mti umekauka eh wanashaga what is happening wednesday is when judas agrees to be used i wish you could screen matthew 26:15 where judas asks nikiwaletea huyu mzee shaguni gani they are bargaining akapewa zile tunguru alizopewa those 30 pieces of silver and that is what he did what are you willing to give me if i deliver him to you and they counted him that that pieces of silver i doubt whether they were valuable then i doubt but he was on a mission so comes thursday is when jesus has the last supper with the disciples that is the day they eat the passover meal that is the day he's handed over to the authorities friday is a day of hardships and tribulations a day of hopelessness and jesus knows exactly what lies ahead of him he knows anajua yanaojiri mbele yake Matthew 29:27:46 Anasema Eli Eli la masabada kisani He knows he's going to suffer And at some point he tells God Remove this cup before me But then he realizes that it is God's will for it to happen When you go through challenges as a Christian you may desire that the challenges may be removed from you but just as jesus did i would urge you if it is to give god's glo- god his glory may the challenges continue because they have a timing they have an expiry date saturday jesus is in the tomb because he's killed but we notice something that the chief priest goes to pilate and tells him he is in the tomb but we are asking you to provide extra security to guard the tomb and he refers to jesus especially in <laughs> matthew 27 verse 63 he refers to jesus as that deceiver who said he can die and rise up on the third day 
that deceiver, I want you, pilot, to give us extra security. As Kari was yonder, armed to the teeth. Ata ikiweze kana wegemeze gari ya polisi. Pale kwa yo kaburi. So that this man can remain there and see what happens on the third day. Kindly note, Resurrection Sunday, which is the next Sunday. Matthew 28, verse 6, where Jesus now rises up. And it is clearly evident that he has risen. Ameonekana, kaburi riko wazi, riko tupu, and besides there's an angel in the tomb telling all those who cared then to go and visit the tomb that he is not here. He has risen. He has risen. And so, the same chief priests begins to hatch a story to counter that. And in verse 63, the chief priests hatches a kamuchoro hapa that we are going to tell Pilate that his disciples came in the night and stole the body. That is why the tomb is empty. Now, who is the deceiver? Christ or the chief priest? It's the chief priest, isn't it? Chief priest, verse 28, 12 to 13. Chief priest hatches a lie. They devised to hatch a plan to counter this resurrection bribed the guards with large sums of money to lie that the disciples came in the night and stole the body. The bottom line is, lies or no lies, Christ is risen. This is called the redemption story. We have telltale stories in our lives. Similar to that of Job, similar to that of Daniel, similar to that of Joseph, similar to that of the three Hebrew boys who are thrown into the lake of fire, thrown into the furnace. We have the story of Hannah, the story of deliverance shows God can redeem you and me, no matter what our background or circumstances are, he is capable. God can use our pains to bring victories in our lives. Pains are not always painful. They bring with them victories. Our pains and challenges are God's launching pad. Through the suffering of Jesus, the world is reconciled and redeemed back to God. Promise of eternal life is given. So what man lost in Genesis is now regained back. This is a story about this Holy Week. Points to ponder. When blind Bartimaeus regained his sight. Just think about it. When the pool of Siloam opened for healing. Think about it. When the leaking lady for those 12 years suddenly got and instantly got her healing. Let's think about it. When you got that job that you didn't have the best qualifications, yet you got it. Let's think about it. When you received that huge favor that you didn't deserve. When strange doors opens in your life and in my life, let's think about it. When in our times, because we all have those bad, low and high times, when in our wilderness days, God becomes our navigator. Think about it. When you have your Red Sea experience, that you see your end, and you even come to a point where you write yourself off. Think about it. When success comes your way, not because of your abilities, 
yet the success lies on you. Askari wana kipia kuwa kiwanja. Namba moja, namba bini, namba tatu hawa shukuriwi. Alia kuwa namba hamsini na nabiwa tunataka wewe. Think about it. When God spared the life of the sheep, mana wageni wamekuja wa shashe. Jogo, ikachinjwa. We have gone through those moments in our lives. Let's think about it. When some misfortune missed you or missed me by a whisker, labda ulisikia kukohoa tu kiodoka hivi, shida ikapita. Those moments, think about them. Do not be tempted to imagine that you are lucky. Kindly don't. There was a force behind all this. Kindly identify with that force. Kindly bow to that force. Thank God because this is Redemption Sunday. When there was announcements here, somebody mentioned at the climax of his announcements, there is a cup of tea, isn't it? We have one here. Kuna moja tutakawanya hapa. Sunday school memory verses. I remember when I was like uh, this young girl on the front seat, you may not see her. During my Sunday school days, there were some two verses. Ilikuwa lazima ukule na ukunywa kila asubu kila jioni. Abu, that is what used to happen. So that would be our cup of tea. One of the verses is Luke 2:52. Don't look. Don't look. But if you never went to Sunday school, you may. <laughs> and you may put it on the screen. But I thought it was important for us, if you may, say it in your mother tongue. Luke 2:52. Kwa kiswahili nasema na Yesu akazidi kukua kwa hekma na kimo akimpendeza Mungu na wanadamu that is the swahili version i know you are not muswahili do it in your mother tongue that's a good cup of tea na ke Yesu agekora akinene haga akiohe haga akienda kwa nega inao na adu i know you can say it and you have said thank you the second verse is john 3:16 This is the only verse that has been translated in all the languages of this universe and communities know it hata kama ni waarabu hata kama ni nani they know it for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life This church is the redemption story. In the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen.